gun, shot. Agent, provocateur, murder, employment, skyfall. Skyfall. Done. While many are saying the James Bond movie Skyfall is the best Bond film ever, I agree for many reasons. And I think Daniel Craig is the best Bond. People who say Sean Connery is the best are just showing their age. It's like people who say the original Star Trek is better than the next generation. They just don't know what they're talking about. Although I have probably alienated about 85% of the audience now, so I will not continue. But what's so great about the Bond movie? Well, rather than just being crazy explosions and chase scenes, although it has a good number of those too, it really asks a lot of fundamental questions about the role intelligence agencies have to play in today's government. Now, the closest person to James Bond I know, other than myself, is our regular intelligence expert, David Harris. So he joins me now to uh, pitch it in as a resident film reviewer. Anthony, the things we do for our country. <laughs> <laughs> so, so start us off here. What did you think about the, about the film? Well, a, a ripping good yarn from London to Shanghai and back to the English Moor. There's lots of explosions, as you say, but a few things to think about as well in intelligence policy terms. Yeah, exactly. And I think we can tell the viewers a few things without spoiling the plot. So if you, if you haven't seen it, don't worry, you don't need to press mute right now. Uh, the, the very beginning of the film, the, the problem that precipitates the action is that, uh, is that somebody has released this file which has the names and identities of all the, the NATO secret agents around the world. And people want to get this because, of course, they'd like to kill all the agents. Now, I understand things like that have actually happened in the recent past. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, there are stories, at least, that uh, one or two lists may have been released by a rogue a former MI6 officer. And uh, again, the details have never been certain, but this is an extremely high-risk situation. And in the U.S. context, going back about 40 years or so, very definitely a whole raft of names, uh, perhaps over 100, maybe a good many more than that, were also uh, released, uh, resulting, uh, according to my understanding, in the death possibly of one or more uh, American intelligence-related officials in Europe. So this is an appropriate kind of flashpoint issue to right. uh, use as a device. So the problem with that being national security secrets get out, uh, you can no longer do covert operations, is that the sort of stuff? That's it, and that was part of the aim, I think, of the individual who was behind the U.S. Uh, leaking. Uh, there was a very calculated uh, wish, I think, to constrain American intelligence, American foreign policy. And uh, these things are even more insidious than are obvious, because if you identify an individual, then a foreign intelligence service, for example, or a terrorist, can backtrack through that individual's own behavior and life, maybe going back decades, to find the people with whom he or she has been connecting. And from there, reverse engineer, if you will, those who might have been involved in intelligence terms with that individual and reckon with those people. Now, there's forward-looking politics in the film, too. In it, Judy Dench, she plays M, so she runs MI6. She has to go in front of a committee, committee hearings, to essentially answer for the validity of MI6 now. We're not in the Cold War anymore, so what's the point of even funding an agency like this, or an agency like CIA, or like CSIS? And of course, the, the actions of the film suggest maybe you still might want to fund MI6, but this is a real conversation that people have, have these days, and, and we do have committee hearings about these very topics. Uh, uh, tell me about that. Well, that's right. I mean, there was an interesting parallelism in the story. You had on the one hand an aging super agent with some questions about the adequacy of the individual in a high tech period. And you, does that happen t today, those sort of questions? Well, they certainly do, and they've been going on for a great many years, to be perfectly honest. And then we saw, of course, the other side of the parallel was whether organizations reliant upon such agents are not themselves outdated in this technological age. But it was years ago, uh, back into the late 70s and early 80s, during the time that Admiral Stansfield Turner was in charge of the CIA, that he became quite convinced that technology was going to be the answer. This was about 1977 through 81. And that therefore he could begin to unload some of the case offices and as you might have regarded them, other impedimenta of the then intelligence system. He looked to satellites and so on. And computer programmers. Exactly. Their desks. Exactly. All of them. Hackers of things. who work for the good guy. Perfect. Yes. And of course, that was a huge, huge theme in the movie, as you remember, cyber warfare and its potentialities. A great service. In fact, it did the, uh, the uh, viewing audience and public policy makers. But 
Stansfield Turner ultimately was cutting his agents. He lost some faith, at least, in what we call Hugh Mint, human intelligence, agents, and so on, only to regret that years later, as he himself conceded, finding that there was indeed a place for human intelligence, I think uh, perhaps an ultimate lesson of the movie itself. Well, one last angle I want to talk about. Uh, you know, we say, how can we be certain that we know we need to fund these organizations? Well, as the film kind of suggests, you can only know for sure if you know what's going on on the inside. You only know what's going on if you're there seeing it. People say, oh, why, why didn't Barack Obama completely disassociate himself from George Bush policies like Guantanamo Bay? And some people say, well, that's because he got in on the first day and he found out stuff that the rest of us don't know. I mean, how can the general public uh, really take, take solace in, in that, that mm -hmm. idea? Well, I think one of the um, ways has to do with some of the innovations and novelties that have developed over the last 30 years, and these things come in the form of various accountability mechanisms. With CSIS, of course, you've had the Inspector General, but you have the Independent Government Watchdog Organization, the Security Intelligence Review Committee, CERC. In the States, they've had a variety, as you know, of intelligence-related oversight committees, and they're going to be at the heart of some of this Benghazi and Petraeus review. Right even unfolding as we speak. So these things, I think, go some way to reassure the public and educate the public about what the realities are there, what the risks really are that are involved. And all of this, we've got to remember in the uh, liberal pluralist Western societies, subject to the judiciary, a system of courts that's got to be active and aggressive. David, thanks so much for joining us with your insight. Pleasure.